things over to Augustina senior, Jamisha Walls, who will be introducing our speaker tonight. Misha is a classical studies and pre-med double major who's being honored this year with the Camus Award for Outstanding Accomplishment in Classical Studies. Thank you, Misha. Hello, everyone. Um, so tonight I will be introducing our lecturer, Dr. Susan Rotroff. Um, Dr. Rotroff attended Bryn Mawr College as an undergraduate studying Greek and classical and Near Eastern archaeology. She was also both a regular and associate member of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens, and she received both her MA and PhD in classical archaeology from Princeton University. Dr. Rotroff has taught at a number of North American institutions, including the Canadian Archaeological Institute, Mount Allison University, Hunter College, Washington University, Florida State, and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She has also taught abroad at the University of Cape Town in South Africa and the American School at Athens. Additionally, Dr. Rotroff has fascinatingly participated in numerous excavations and archaeological surveys on land and underwater in locations, including Greece, Turkey, the UK, and North Africa. Now, Dr. Rotroff is the current Jarvis Thurston and Mona Van Doyne Professor in the Humanities Professor Emerita at Washington University in St. Louis. Among her grants and fellowships, she was a John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Fellow from, 19, from 1988 to 1993, and she received a National Endow Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship for the American School of Classical Studies at Athens in 2009 to 2010. And she held a John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship in 2013 to 2014. As for her many other awards and accomplishments, Dr. Rotroff received the gold medal from the AIA in 2011 and an Aristia Award of the Alumni from the American School of Classical Studies at Athens in 2010. Finally, Dr. Rotroff's publications include scholarly reviews, book chapters, journal articles, edited volumes, co-authored books, and monographs. While these are far too numerous to list one by one, I will note a chapter on the ceramic industry in last year's The Cambridge Companion to Ancient Athens, as well as her most recent book, co-authored with Maria Leaston and Lynn Snyder, The, uh, the Agora Bone Well. Now, while there's much more I could say about Dr. Rotoff, in the interest of giving her time to speak, I'll get to the main point. Dr. Rotoff's talk tonight is entitled Drugs, Dreams, and Fumigations, Doctoring in Ancient Athens. So please, let's all join in welcoming Dr. Rotoff. Okay, I'm sharing my screen. I hope everybody is seeing it. And thank you very much, Jamisha, for that very kind uh, introduction. Um, I'm very pleased to be speaking to you um, and I wish I could be there in person. Uh, I was there in person maybe about 30 years ago and I enjoyed my visit very much, um, but it's better that we can do it this way than not at all. But I'm also very happy to be the um, lecturer for the Oscar Bernier Memorial Lecture. Um, I met Oscar Bernier when I was a young student um, and he was at the end of his career. He was very kind to young students, um, although he had a gigantic stature in archeology. span um, He was very famous for discovering the temple of Poseidon at Ismia, which is really one of the most important Greek temples and one of the very earliest ever built in stone. Uh, this photograph shows him many years earlier when he was excavating actually in, um, in Athens on the slopes of the Acropolis. Um, Oops, something changed. Can you still see my presentation? Hmm. Because I can't. <laughs> I'm going to start over again. I'm going to stop and start over again. See if I can get it right. Okay, got it back? Yes, somebody tell me, because I can't see you, so somebody say something. It looks good. Okay, great. Okay, but on to the main event here, dreams, drugs, and fumigations. Um, I'm going to talk about three ancient approaches to curing, to healing, that people could uh, utilize when they got sick in antiquity. Oh, it happened again, sorry. I keep pressing something that's the wrong thing to press. So 
I'm going to stop pressing that. Okay. Um, they got sick as much or more than we do. Um, and these are various ways of dealing with that problem. Now, um, I can claim to know quite a bit about ancient Athens. We're looking here, of course, at the iconic Acropolis, the religious center of the city. Um, but in the foreground is the Agora, which was the secular center of the city. And we'll be visiting there uh, in the second half of the lecture. Um, and I can claim to know a lot about the Agora too, because I've been working there um, since the 1970s. And my job there has been studying ancient pottery. Here I'm working out the capacity of an early Iron Age cooking pot. Uh, so my interest in pottery um, is not so much just to admire the pottery, but to understand what pottery can tell us about the activities of ancient people. Um, and that is what led me into the enormous and complex field of ancient medicine in which I have really only uh, dipped a toe. Uh, in this slide here, you can see in the background some pottery and I'm in the basement of the Agora Museum doing my work. Um, and here's another picture of that basement and you can see all the pottery that's stored there. And stored on those shelves was the very peculiar pot is there a problem? Okay. Sorry. Is can you hear me? Is it okay? Okay. Apologies. I I muted. Uh, please keep your microphones off. Um, but I will try to mute someone if again if that happens. I can I can mute them. Okay. Um. So on the left-hand side, you see two views of this very strange cooking pot that I discovered on these shelves. It had been misshelved for 50 years. Um, and when I, came, when I came upon it, um, I had to try to figure out what it was. And that brought me to the field of ancient medicine. And we'll come back to that at the end of the lecture. But first I want to say some more general things about ancient medicine um, and about the best known approaches to ancient healing, which was through healing sanctuaries. Now the God of ancient medicine, of course the Greeks had a God for everything and the God primarily associated with medicine was Asclepius. He was a son of the God Apollo um, he's always shown as a mature bearded god with a staff that he leans upon, which is not because he's lame. It, it was kind of like um, a, a Victorian gentleman having a walking stick. It, men often had staffs, but around his, his staff coils an enormous snake. And snakes were very important in his cult. On the right, you can see a coin um, from the city of Pergamon where there was an important sanctuary of Asclepius um, in the third and second centuries BC. And you see on one side of the coin, um, a serpent very prominently displayed. So Asclepius was the healing God, uh, or maybe he was a hero. Nobody was entirely sure which type of divinity he was. Um, but he, pres he presided over many healing sanctuaries, but the earliest and most important in Greece was a sanctuary at Epidaurus in the Peloponnese, um, the southernmost of these two stars. Uh, a lot has, is known about the sanctuary, but it is primarily in ruins. And what you see in the lower right is a model that reconstructs what it would have looked like in its prime. Uh, it's best known for its spectacular ancient Greek theater, which is beautifully preserved um, and certainly the finest uh, Greek theater um, in Greece itself. And it dates to the fourth century. But as early as the sixth century, uh, Asclepius presided over this shrine as a healing shrine, a place to go to when you were sick where the God could heal you. Um, rather like modern healing shrines like Lourdes perhaps, which is the most famous um, 
those who were ill went there and through the intervention of the God, uh, they were healed. Now, if you wanted, if you were sick in Athens in the first half of the fifth century, uh, you could go to Epidaurus, but it was a long journey. It was either a sea journey or an even longer and more dangerous journey over land. Um, and if you were sick, you wouldn't enjoy that very much. Even people who were well had trouble with traveling. It was difficult and difficult in antiquity. So you wouldn't go there for something minor. It would be like going to a famous clinic somewhere, going to the Mayo Clinic in order to consult um, the physicians there. But fortunately for the Athenians, Asclepius came to Athens in 420 BCE. We know exactly when this happened. Um, a shrine to Asclepius was established on the slopes of the Acropolis where this circle is. It was placed within an already sacred area. And we know exactly when this happened because uh, the person responsible, whose name was Telemachus, set up a monument within the sanctuary. It's very fragmentary. You can see it here, just bits and pieces, but it's been possible to piece it together. And it includes a fragmentary inscription. Which you see it's Greek text here, but we can look at the more accessible bits uh, translated into English. And they tell us that the god having come up from Zaya, Zaya was a harbor of Athens, at the time of the great mysteries, this was in the fall and it was the uh, festival of Demeter and Persephone, he lodged at the Eleusinian, that is the sanctuary of those goddesses. There was no sanctuary for him yet. So he got there first, then they established the sanctuary. And then Telemachus, the founder of the sanctuary, having sent for something, which is missing from the inscription, brought him here in a chariot in accordance with oracles. And Hygieia came at the same time. So the whole shrine was established in the archonship of Astyphilus of Kedantidae. And we know when this fellow, Astyphilus, was archon. It was from the summer of 420 to the summer of 419. So Asclepius came to Athens and was established here in the fall of 420. And he came in some physical form. We don't know what the form was. It may have been a statue. Um, it may have been a snake. Um, but he physically came and a place was built for him uh, with, uh, by Telemachus um, and probably at Telemachus' expense. Um, and therefore, you could visit a healing sanctuary more conveniently close to home. Now, the earliest constructions in this sanctuary were certainly made of wood. They put them up quickly so that they could house the god. Um, what you can see now um, was excavated in the 19th century, um, in the late 19th century. And it looks more like a stone yard than anything with all the bits of the later um, marble buildings spread around. But we can reconstruct its form um, in the first century of our era. Uh, gradually, the um, wooden buildings were replaced with stone ones uh, that are preserved with their foundations up to today. So in many ways, um, it's a very standard sanctuary. Probably the most important part was the Eastern part. And that's what we know the most about. It had a monumental gateway like most sanctuaries. You'd go in that way and then you would enter the sanctuary proper. It had a temple and an altar, which is also very standard. Um, but it had some unusual things as well. It had a spring that had been cut into the rock of the Acropolis. Healing sanctuaries often had springs. Um, they were in some cases rather like spas. You went and drank the waters. And also, of course, uh, water is necessary for hygiene. Even more unusual, however, was a great monumental pit lined with stone, covered with a little roof, it's certainly part of the original sanctuary, uh, but we aren't sure of its purpose. It might have been for sacrifices. Um, heroes, unlike gods, received their sacrifices underground. So the sacrificed 
thing was placed in the ground. So this could have been a, for sacrifices to Asclepius as a hero, or it might have been a dwelling place for the snakes that we know were kept in the sanctuary. And finally, there was a long hall in the Roman period, even two long halls. And this was probably for the rite of incubation. This was the central rite or activity of a healing shrine. Um, the patient went to the shrine and incubated. That meant he or she slept in the shrine, had a dream, and through that was healed. That's the simple and ritualistic way of expressing it. Now, we are lucky in that we actually have a sort of eyewitness account of this um, procedure in the form of a play written by the playwright Aristophanes, the most famous of the ancient com comedic uh, writers, comedy writers. Um, it was produced in 388, um, and it's called Plutos, which means wealth. It's a personification of wealth. And the story as it is presented is that the problems of the world are caused by the fact that Plutos is blind. The hero of the play, who's a poor down and out Athenian everyman, has the idea that if he, if Plutos could see, everything would be better. Plutos hangs around with the wealthy. He hangs around with the likes of Donald Trump um, and um, Bill Gates, um, but if he could see, he'd hang around with us and we'd have all the money. So he takes Plutus to the healing shrine to have him healed. He goes along, uh, along with him goes his trusty slave, Cario, who's really the brains of the operation, which is usually the arrangement in these ancient comedies. The God goes, the God is healed, and later on, Cario recounts what they saw at the shrine. And it gives us the whole sequence of what you did when you visited the healing shrine. So Cario says, first, we led him down to the sea to purify him. So purification, prayer, and sacrifice are part of the preparation for the experience. Um, then he says, once the wafers and various offerings had been consecrated on the altar and the cake of wheaten meal had been handed over to another god, Hephaestus, so uh, the sacrifice, here a bloodless sacrifice, but some people uh, sacrificed an animal. Um, we made Plutus lie down on a couch according to the rite. And this would probably have taken place in the stoa, though the patient could in fact sleep anywhere in the sanctuary. The lights were put out, the priest enjoined us to sleep, recommending that we keep silent, and we were all lying down quietly. Then the god arrives, and he's accompanied by his daughters. Now, um, Asclepius had a bunch of daughters. All of them are personifications of various things that have to do with health. Yasso and Panacea. Panacea means panacea, cure-all. Yasso is healing. Um, another daughter was Hygieia, hygiene. Um, so he's accompanied by these daughters. And this is the incubation scene. This is what was presumably a dream, but since it's a play, it's recounted as what actually happened. Asclepius did the round of the patients and examined them all with great attention. He seated himself at the head of Plutus's bed and took a clean rag and wiped his eyelids. Panacea covered his head and face with a purple cloth while the god whistled and two enormous snakes came rushing from the sanctuary. So there really were snakes there. Uh, although this is a play, the people who are listening to this play knew about the sanctuary and some of them have been there. So it has to be a believable account. They slipped beneath the cloth and they licked the patient's eyelids. Plutus rose up. He could see. So incubation, dream, and healing. The scene that you see here um, is a votive gift that was given at another Asclepian sanctuary in the Piraeus. Um, and it illustrates the scene for us. We have the patient lying on a couch. She's lying on an animal skin, probably referring to the, sac the sacrifice she made before she went in and went to sleep and had her dream. And then we have the god, 
and one of his daughters, the god is laying his hands upon her body to cure her. And then off at the left, conflating two different periods of time, we have the woman and her family with their hands raised in a gesture of respect and prayer, um, thanking the God for what he's done because apparently he did cure her and so she gave this thank offering. Now we have uh, records of a lot of dreams that people have. There's a series of um, inscriptions in uh, Epidaurus that list these dreams. Some are very fanciful, some of the inscriptions are very fragmentary, but a lot of them um, can be pieced together and we can get an idea of the experience that people had in their dream. So Agamea of, um, of Kia slept in the temple hoping for children. She dreamed that a serpent lay on her belly. So the snake comes in again. Thereafter, she had five children. So her barrenness was cured. Clinatus of Thebes was invested with lice. He slept in the temple and dreamed that the god stripped him and made him stand upright and brushed the lice from his body. The next morning, he left the temple in good health and without lice. So there are lots of accounts like this that they never talk about any kind of treatment that the person received. They only tell what the god did through the dream that healed the patient. Now, one thing they also stress is that it's very important to express your gratitude. So people who don't get in trouble, Herman of Thassos, his blindness was cured by Asclepius, but since afterwards he did not bring the thank offerings, the God made him blind again. When he came back and slept in the temple, the God made him well. And I'm sure Hermon was careful to give a thank offering then. We have a great many of these thank offerings because most people were quite meticulous about essentially paying their bill for the healing that they'd gotten. Now, the very wealthy could give money or um, vessels made of precious metals or a statue of the God. Uh, but the most common gift was an image, usually in Athens in uh, stone, an image of the part of the body that was healed. So you see a pair of eyes, an ear, some breasts, some feet. Um, all parts of the body are represented. We can rarely tell what was wrong with them. They usually don't show a pathology, though sometimes they do. But we can see the body parts that were afflicted. Eyes are very, very common. Breasts are common. Problems with breastfeeding, perhaps. Um, but they do uh, demonstrate the thankfulness of the patient. Um, interestingly, this is a practice that has persisted through the ages or been revived. It's hard to follow it all the way through. But if you go into um, modern uh, Orthodox churches in Greece, you will sometimes see little images of body parts hanging on an icon. So here you see some examples. You can buy them in any religious uh, supply store in Greece. Some are made of silver, so they have some intrinsic value. Others are just made of tin, but they testify to the healing. Um, these are what we term votives because you first approach the god, the goddess, the Virgin Mary, whoever it might be, and you say, if you will heal me, please heal me. If you do, I will give you a gift. So I vow to give you this gift and then um, the gift is made from the vow. Often the ancient um, images have written on them for a vow. So it's explicitly uh, a payment that is vowed at um, before healing begins. Now here's the Esclepian, which we've just looked at, the biggest shrine in Athens. And this would be like going to the biggest hospital um, in your town, the one with the best reputation. But you wouldn't go to that hospital for absolutely every ailment that you had. Um, you might go to a place in your neighborhood. Um, we now have urgent care centers. You know, if you um, uh, had an accident, you might be more likely to go to some place local like that. Um, and in Athens, too, there were many smaller, less elaborate sanctuaries, and they were presided over by all sorts 
of divine entities. Three have been excavated within the city, and there are several more outside the walls of the city, but I'm concentrating here just on the city. Um, one here in the southern part, which was dedicated to a hero called Aminos, who is otherwise unknown. Um, here, a sanctuary dedicated to Zeus, the chief Olympian god, but this is a special um, formulation of Zeus, Zeus Hupsistos, which simply means Zeus the highest, whose specialty was healing. And he was active particularly in the Roman period. These other um, uh, shrines were active from the fourth century uh, down into the Roman period. And then finally here, um, a couple of inscriptions were found that speak of a hero who doesn't even have a name at all. He's just called Heros Yatras, hero doctor. Um, so he's an ancient healthcare hero. We haven't even found his shrine, just the inscriptions that talk about him. Now, these places were far less elaborate. Um, we assume they had a similar procedure, though we don't have any direct evidence of what went on there. Uh, I can show you one of them just to give you an idea of the scale. This is the sanctuary of Aminos, and this scale down here is 15 meters, which is about 50 feet. So the whole shrine would have fit in a 50 foot square. It has no temple. It has no altar. Uh, it had an offering table which I guess could stand in for an altar, but you wouldn't burn um, uh, animal bones on it. You would just place all uh, offerings upon it. And it has a water source. And what it mostly has is thank offerings. So pedestals like this with an inscription saying that so-and-so set this offering up to the hero, uh, body parts. And here, one of the most elaborate body part reliefs that has turned up in Athens, it shows the patient, the healed patient, presenting a gigantic model of his diseased leg. And here we even see his complaint, a swollen vein. And he's placing it in the sanctuary where there are already other um, thank offerings that have been placed there. So uh, from what we get from the uh, sources that describe the healing experience, it's all about sleeping in the temple and being healed. There's very little about any kind of actual treatment done by people who were trained um, in medicine, but there certainly was treatment. It's simply that in this religious framework, one did not describe it that way. So here is a votive relief that was given by a man named Archinos um, in a hero in a healing sanctuary out in the Attic countryside. And it conflates three different things. First of all, we have Archinos lying on a couch asleep, having his dream. And while he sleeps, one of the sanctuary snakes has come to tend to his shoulder. Then we see his dream. Here is the healing hero, who in this case is named Amphiarius, but he looks exactly like Asclepius. And he is using a scalpel to perform an operation on the young man's shoulder. So he is treating it, although it's in a dream form. And then finally over here, we see Archinus afterwards, healthy, healed, his arm raised in the gesture of respect and prayer. And this is the gift that he has given to the God. In fact, this is a portrait of the object we're looking at. So there was treatment in these sanctuaries. It's just, it wasn't the important thing to talk about. But if we look back to the inscription that told us about the founding of the Asclepian, there is a very fragmentary relief here, but in it, we can see some medical instruments. It's easiest to see in the drawing. We have the god Asclepius, his daughters, um, but hanging on the wall are some forceps and some other objects as well. So treatment went on. People were healed, not just by the miracle of the god, but because the priests and others at the healing sanctuaries 
had experience of medical matters. They knew about treatment. Um, they knew about surgery. They knew about uh, medicine and drugs and how to apply them to bring about an auspicious outcome for their patients. But treatment went on in other places as well. And I wanna to turn to the second part of the story, um, which is a little bit more down to earth kind of medicine. Um, this is a little oil jug, just big enough to fit in the palm of your hand uh, that was painted in Athens in the earlier part of the fifth century. And it shows medical treatment. Here's the doctor, a very young man. He's performing bloodletting on one patient. Another patient is waiting in line. He's obviously um, has a wound of some kind and he's uh, coming to have the bandage renewed. Um, and then we have four more people. We can't tell what's wrong with them. They're just waiting in line. They're chatting with one another, or perhaps this is a patient who's already been treated and leaving. But it reminds us that there were doctors. Um, they're mentioned only in passing, though. Um, some, uh, they aren't particularly high status people necessarily, um, although more and more in the Roman period they were. Um, there was a state doctor, the Athenian state paid an individual to practice medicine. Obviously he couldn't treat everybody. Um, but I want to look now at some of these more, uh, a, a little bit of evidence for this kind of day-to-day -day healing. And we'll be starting out with medicines and drugs. So again, we look across at the Acropolis and at the Agora excavations here. Um, and those excavations have produced quite a bit of interesting evidence for the practice of medicine, but it's very spread out, it's hard to find, um, and it's hard to track down. But I've tracked down a couple of instances that I would like to share with you. Um, so here again, to orient you with this model of Athens as it was in the Roman period, the Acropolis at the center, and then the Asclepian and the three other hearing, hear, healing shrines I told you about. And then here's the Agora, and it stands out for its monumental buildings. It was the secular and political center. It had buildings for law courts. It had buildings for um, magistrates. Uh, so it, it was an important place that's mentioned repeatedly in our ancient sources. And that, of course, was what drew archaeologists to it. Excavation began there in the 19th century. Um, and then in 1931, the American School of Classical Studies at Athens began um, a scientific excavation there, which continues to this day. There will be another excavation season this summer. Um, and you can see the foundations of large, regular buildings. Uh, there's even one that has been reconstructed in modern times. It's a, it's a second century BC building um, rebuilt in the 1950s to serve as a museum. Uh, the site is crossed by the main street of Athens, which led all the way from the city wall up to the Acropolis. Um, so it was an important and monumental place. But archeologists find a lot of things that they actually weren't looking for. They were looking for monumental buildings and they found those, but all around the, the public square, are private neighborhoods. And you can see that these are very irregular structures and they aren't very impressive. These are the houses and shops of the ancient Athenians. And excavation there tells us a lot more about the lives of the very ordinary Athenians rather than the more prominent ones. So these Athenians lived and worked in very ordinary houses. The houses were built of mud brick, and so their walls have all long ago disintegrated, but they do leave behind stone foundations, which you see at the upper left, and we can reconstruct on paper what the houses would have looked like. And we find their tile roofs, we find their foundations, but not much else. They all, however, had water sources. There was no running water in Athens. You got your water from a well or a cistern. 
And when those houses fell into ruin or were destroyed, their debris within the houses was shoved into the wells that were no longer being used. So when we excavate things from the wells, we find things from the houses. And they tell us something about what was going on in those houses. So I'm going to look at two different instances of water sources that contain things relevant to the practice of medicine. Now, the kinds of things we find, um, they obviously have to be made of durable materials, and we find discarded medicine bottles. Sometimes they even have labels. These two examples, you can see they're about the same shape and the same size. This is two centimeters, less than an inch. So you can see how small they are, uh, probably about two and a half inches tall. And they have these stamped labels. And the labels contain the word lichios, it's hardly read here, but, or lichion, which is the name of a drug. So I've put it in red here. Uh, then there's a name of a person, Nikias here and Hermophilus, the son of Moschion there. That's the name of the person who compounded the drug, either a pharmacist or a physician. And then there's the stamp of approval, a word that means guaranteed. This stamp is a guarantee that this bottle really does contain the drug Lycion. You'll find bottles that look like this without stamps, beware, it might not be the real, true Lycion. We've also found a couple of lead medicine bottles, even smaller, these are maybe an inch and a half high. Lead doesn't seem like a good thing to put medicine in, but they were not aware of the poisonous qualities of, of lead, and it does conserve things very well. So you can make out part of the inscription Lycion here, uh, this Lycion was made by Artemidorus. Um, this one was made by Cleon. These are all imported. The ones on the left were made on the island of Rhodes, where there was a seemingly a dynasty of well-regarded pharmacists who turned out this desirable medicine. So this was first-rate um, pharmacon, a first-rate drug um, that had to be imported and was probably relatively expensive. Now, what on earth is Lycion anyway? The excavations can't tell us that. For that, we have to go to the medical literature. And there is a vast body of ancient medical literature that has been intensively studied and published. Um, the little bit of it that's relevant for this question um, is an, uh, a book written by a man named Pedanius Dioscorides he was born about 30 of the common era. We have no idea what he looked like, but he was such an important figure that there are many later imagined portraits of him. This is a, a 16th century portrait. Um, he was a doctor, um, a specialist in the compounding of ancient drugs, mainly from plant, but also from animal materials and um, from minerals. Um, and he wrote a book all about it. He lived in what is today Turkey, um, in the southern part of Turkey and studied at the great town of Tarsus. And the book he wrote, Peri Hules Atricis, De Materia Medica, or About Medical Material. Um, it was very quickly translated into Latin, the language of the Western half of the Roman Empire, and from Latin into a vast array of other languages, um, including Arabic, you, and it was the basic textbook of pharmacology until the early modern period, believe it or not. Um, this Spanish translation, 16th century, translated into Spanish, still the basic textbook that people went to to understand uh, medicines and their compounding and their use. So what does Dioscorides tell us about Lycaon? His um, entries typically give a description of the plant, um, a recipe or several recipes for making it into a useful medicine, and then a list of things it can be used to treat. So Lycian is a thorny tree with branches three cubits long or more. A uh, cubit is 18 inches, so that's uh, four and a half feet. It's a pretty big bush. It has a fruit like pepper, black, 
bitter, thick, and smooth. The bark is pale. It has many broad woody roots. It grows mostly in Cappadocia and Lycia, hence the name, but also in many other places. Uh, Cappadocia and Lycia are both in what is today Turkey. So it grew in the area that um, Dioscorides was most familiar with. Now, Dioscorides' original text was almost certainly unillustrated. He and other medical writers expressed, expressed um, distrust of medical illustrations um, because they felt that these illustrations would be made by artists, not doctors, and they would be misleading. But later editions of his work um, like the earliest manuscript, that illustrated manuscript we have, um, dates to the sixth century in the common era, they do have illustrations and we aren't sure exactly where they came from. They don't all agree. Um, this is a 10th century illustration of Lycian. This is a 19th century one, still being um, published in the 19th century in Persian. And these two look a little bit alike, um, but this is the 16th century book. Um, its illustration looks completely different. Um, this uh, illustrator had decided he knew what plant it was and he drew that plant. Not necessarily what Dioscorides thought the plant was. However, it is possible to figure out what plant Lycaon was uh, through, first of all, a careful look at his description and also a study of the medical tradition over the years, some of the plants in question continued to be used to treat the ailments in question um, for hundreds and hundreds of years up until times of modern recording. So on that basis, um, botanists have decided that probably Lycian um, is a plant of the Ramnus genus, probably Ramnus cathartica or buckthorn, which you see illustrated here. You can see, for instance, um, the berries, the fruit that he talked about, which is black and bitter. Uh, in um, modern times, this plant has been used to treat diseases of the eye, which was the primary use of ancient Lycaon, according to our medical writers. Now, Dioscorides talks about the medical uses of Lycaon, um, and he starts out with the eyes because that was the main thing it, he, it treated, as we know not only from him, but from other writers. It clears darkness of the pupils, heals psoriasis of the eyelids, irritations, and old fluxes. But then there's a whole long list of other things. It's like a patent medicine. It'll do anything. As an ointment, it's good for infected ears, tonsils, gums, fissures of the lips, tears of the fingers, chafing. As an infusion, it's good for intestinal problems. Mix it with liquid for coughs and discharges of blood. And this one is very useful. Give it in pill form to those bitten by a rabid dog. I don't think it did much good, but I guess you could give it to them. You can use it to dye your hair yellow. It cures, cures whitlows, herpes, putrid ulcers, and so forth. So a lot of claims made for Lycian, um, though it does seem by modern experiment to have had some effect on some eye ailments. Now, there aren't very many of these stamped containers. Uh, if we plot them on the Agora with its main street and its public square, uh, the blue stars are the stamped jugs imported from the island of Rhodes. Not very many. It was expensive. It's not surprising. The purple stars, only three examples that we found of the lead ones, again, imports. But there are vessels that are the same shape and almost the same size, a little bit larger than the lead ones um, that have no stamp, no identification, were made locally. Um, and most likely they were containers for the local knockoff, the local version of Lycaon. Buckthorn, the plant grows in Greece. You could make a medicine from it. Um, you could make almost anything and put it in here, probably in ointment form, judging from the shape of the pot. Um, but it's not the kind of pot that would be useful for much else. So it's useful to plot where we've found those pots. And as you can see, they're fairly numerous. And what interested me was this concentration over here. 
Um, this is a concentration of 13 little pots like this, as well as fragments of four more that were found in a cistern in a large building. So here you see the building reconstructed. Here you see part of its foundations. All that's left is the foundations. Um, and there was a cistern in this building, in, in this room of the building that contained these little pots. So uh, in order to understand this better, um, we need to think more about the context. When you have multiple medicine containers of the same medicine, you might think there was a person who was a habitual user of that medicine. Maybe there was somebody who had chronic eye problems and he used this stuff all the time. And of course, when he'd used up one dose, he threw the bottle away. Um, the other possibility, however, is that, that this is the establishment of a person who made this medicine uh, of the druggist. And these were the containers that he had uh, ready to fill or filled and ready to sell. Now, if we look at the building form, um, that may give us a little bit of help in trying to understand this. Uh, it's obviously not a house. Um, it, instead, it's a large building with a lot of uh, rooms that are all the same size. Uh, a likely identification is that it was a shop building, a kind of ancient mall. We know that ancient individuals as well as the state owned buildings where they could rent out individual rooms to people for their businesses. And it was a source of income for the state or for the individual. It's even mentioned by one of the ancient orators, Iskines, in the fourth century, who says, um, if a physician happens to move into one of these shops on the street, we call it a surgery. If he moves out and a smith moves in, it's a smithy. If it's a fuller, it's a laundry and so forth. So a changing clientele of people who rented these facilities as long as they needed them. If we take a quick look at what else was in the cistern, um, there is a grindstone, a pestle. There's another ointment container of, of a different kind. There were also a couple of whetstones. So he, he or she may have had um, medical instruments that required sharpening. So I think this was probably the office of a doctor or um, the, the, the um, shop of a drug maker um, who was selling this locally made drug at um, an appealing price. The last part of my story um, involves another cistern and no concentration and no architecture. This is empty because those buildings have all been destroyed. There were houses there and we've nicknamed this cistern the Fidon Street Cistern because of the modern street that was above it. And I show this picture because first of all it allows you to visualize the relationship of the cistern to the Acropolis up above here and also if you mentally remove some of the neoclassical detail on this house and of course the utility poles, this neighborhood probably didn't look too different from the ancient neighborhood where um, the practitioner I'm gonna tell you about was working. So in that cistern, uh, there was a lot of pottery, very nice pottery. Whoever lived there was not poor. They weren't rich. They weren't dining off gold and silver, but they had about as nice a set of pottery as anybody would have. Um, and it's easily datable to the late second and early first century. The house was probably destroyed uh, when the Roman general Sulla sacked the city in 86 BCE. So we have a nice date, but this at last is where my very strange looking pot was found. Uh, now let me introduce you to my pot a little bit. As you can see, it's not terribly big. This is 10 centimeters, um, say four inches. It's maybe seven or eight inches in diameter. It has a very strange lens shape, very squashed down. Um, we know it's a cooking pot because of the material it's made of. It's a very grainy fabric that was capable of withstanding heat. 
Um, it's also smoky and um, burnt, so it, it was used with heat. But it has problems as a cooking pot. This is a normal cooking pot here. Um, but the, my little pot wouldn't function very well. It was too small. You could only get about three cups into it. Uh, it would be very hard to clean. You couldn't reach your hand in to clean the interior. It would be impossible to pour the contents out without making a terrible mess. It wouldn't even be very easy to dip or spoon the contents out. And as I was puzzling over this, um, one of my colleagues said, well, it's like you've got a pot where the contents have to be used up in place. They have to be used up in situ. I thought, well, what kind of pot would that be? Um, and I thought, ah, how about a vaporizer? You boil something in it and the liquid eventually leaves in the form of steam. So it is used up in C2. So something like this, which is after all a medical implement, a little steamer or vaporizer that gives you, as they advertise, comforting visible moisture for cough and cold relief. Put a little dab of Vicks Vapo Rub in it, heat it up, hold your nose over the aperture, and you can breathe this in and Im um, improve your congested uh, state. So I certainly think my pot could have been used that way. The question is, did ancient doctors ever prescribe such a treatment? And for that, we have to go back to the medical literature again, uh, this time to the famous Hippocratic corpus. Hippocrates, another imaginary portrait here, um, was born about 460 and of course well known to you from his famous oath, uh, but he wrote much um, in addition to that. Um, the Hippocratic corpus contains writings by Hippocrates on various things, Probably the most famous one is called the sacred disease. It was about epilepsy. And he was famous for declaring that there was nothing sacred about it and giving um, uh, a non-religious explanation of the ailment. Um, but he wrote about uh, many other ailments as well. And then other doctors, his colleagues, his followers, on down to the second century of the common era, wrote similar treatises. And these have all been gathered together as the Hippocratic Corpus. So I dove into the Hippocratic Corpus, which is an enormous body of literature, fortunately very well indexed, <clears throat> and I discovered that yes, ancient doctors did use vapor treatments. Um, in fact, they were quite common and they had two different types, wet treatment and dry treatment. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, so the wet treatment for a quartan fever, if the patient is vigorous and seems to be in good health, but has fallen into a fever as a result of fatigue or a journey, and the fever becomes quartan, that is to say, it recurs every four days, which is symptomatic of malaria, a common ancient ailment. Give him a vapor bath and then garlic dipped in honey. Or for a brain complaint, if when the flux and pain have stopped, he feels a heaviness above his eyebrows, make him take a vapor bath with vinegar, water, and oregano. So different formulas for what you put into the liquid to boil so that the person can breathe in the steam. Much more alarming is the process known as fumigation, the dry treatment um, in which the materials that are burnt are often extremely unpleasant. <clears throat> These were often treatments for women's diseases, particularly um, hysteria, which was a disease, a, a series of symptoms that were believed to be caused by the movement of the womb, the hystera. And if the womb was out of place, you would have these symptoms. And so the treatments were designed to put the womb back in its right place. So make a fumigation with scrapings of black goat horn or deer horn and throw it on hot coals so as to have as much smoke as possible. The woman breathes in as much as she can through her nostrils, poor thing. But this is to force her womb, which is too high, down further as it scuttles away from the noxious throat. Um, a possibly even more unpleasant treatment for bleeding, mix ground wheat with vinegar and sulfur, 
in the morning, build a fire, put the mixture on it, add mullen pulp and the residue on a fuller's comb, diminish the heat and boil so you get the most smoke. Have a stool with an opening and sit the woman there covering her with clothes so that the smoke does not escape. Throw the vinegar mixture on the fire. And so the women, woman will absorb this from below through her vagina and her womb then will scuttle upwards because apparently it has been too low. So they did use such treatments. And I even found the information that fum you may fumigate also with lentil shaped pots, takois ostrachinois, pouring in hot water. And whatever else my pot may be, it's definitely lentil shaped or lens shaped. So there is specific reference to this medical instrument in the Hippocratic corpus. And I feel confident that we are in the presence of um, materials that were used by an ancient doctor um, around the beginning of the first century BCE. Um, just a couple of notes um, before closing. Um, to support that uh, contention, we can look at the other material in the cistern. There are several measuring cups. These don't look like modern measuring cups, but I assure you that this baggy, funny shape was used for measuring liquids in antiquity. And of course, if you make drugs, you have to make them according to a recipe, which has very specific amounts of the different ingredients that you must put in. So a person compounding drugs would need measuring devices. Um, he or she would also need um, pulverizing uh, mechanisms the pestle and mortar, of course, are still emblematic of uh, apothecary, of pharmacology. And there were two pestles in the deposit, um, each of them uh, worthy of a little note. Um, one of them, you can appreciate its very worn lower surface here. It's broken. There was an upper part. It's a, a shape called a finger pestle, or the upper part is the joint of the finger which you held onto while rubbing the plant um, that you were um, going to add to your um, drug. We didn't find any trace of the mortar. Uh, so this practitioner probably used a wooden mortar, which was fairly common. Um, and even more fascinating to me is this tiny little grinder. Again, you can appreciate its worn surface. It's made of an exotic stone. It must be an import. Um, and in fact, it is a hoary antique. What it, it began life as an early Bronze Age weight. These have been studied in detail. Here are some examples from Bronze Age sites, and some of them have little dots on them to indicate their value. This is obviously an antique. It was about 2,400 years old when the doctor on Fidon Street was using it, um, I'd like to think that, you know, it was perhaps pa passed down in his family, um, maybe not that long. Um, but it's also true that some of these uh, prehistoric um, shaped stones were believed in themselves to have healing properties. So I think uh, that there is no doubt that we uh, have found the place where, uh, um, an ancient medical practitioner worked. Um, unlike uh, the first example, he didn't have a separate shop. Um, he practiced medicine out of his home, which was probably a fairly common uh, occurrence. Many people had their workplace and their home together. Now he may have been what the Greeks called a pharmacotribes, a drug grinder, someone who produced the drugs to sell to doctors. Um, but because he has the fumigation pot, he or she, because there were female doctors, um, I think uh, that this person may have actually been a doctor. Now, in conclusion, healing sanctuaries with their rituals and their dreams clearly offered enormous comfort and spiritual support for healing, as well as practical healing that is kind of behind the scenes. The medical literature tells us a huge amount about the ancient medicines and medical treatments. But for me, these humble objects offer an especially direct 
and intimate connection with the medical experience of ancient people, both the patients and those who endeavored to cure them. And I hope that they have given you too some insight into these ancient lives. Thank you. I can, I can hear all the applause everywhere. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Rotroff. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna leave a couple of seconds for more applause. Um, and I hope you've got some time for questions. Sure, yes. Um, so if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand or put a, a note in the chat and I'll uh, try to keep this orderly as possible and kind of call on you. Um, but please, uh, Feel free. Uh, so I see a question from Elise Brenner. Um, she's asking, do you have a favorite project or excavation you've worked on? Oh, I've worked on lots and I loved all of them, but um, the Agora, I mean, I'm an Agora person. I've, uh, I love working at that excavation. Um, one reason is that the finds of the excavation are like a vast library. So when you find something there and you think, I wonder what this is, there's a, there, there are literally thousands of other objects that you can investigate in order to try to find out something about it. Um, and these are often things that aren't published or they're things that not, are not easy to find out through library research. And um, you, know, you can get a toehold on a question by looking at the objects. Um, as I did with my little medicine pot, I mean, I didn't know anything, of, I'd heard one lecture uh, about fumigation. I'd heard that that was a medical practice, but um, it really led me on an absolutely fascinating journey. So, you know, the famous George Bass, the underwater archaeologist used to say, the greatest discoveries are made in the library. So, you know, the greatest discoveries are, you know, when you're finding out about something, not just when you're finding it. Finding it is exciting, but finding out about it is, uh, there's nothing like it. Great, thank you. Um, I'm seeing a, a question from Zachariah, is it? Um, do you want to uh, say that aloud or do you want me to read it? Um, Zachariah, feel free to chime in. Yeah, sure. Uh, my question was, uh, which of the three fumigation drugs or dreams was uh, most often used during the time? Was one more used more than the other? Yeah, the problem about antiquity is we really don't have decent statistics for uh, how often people did things. Obviously, the healing sanctuaries, they're, they're all over the place. So people participated in that frequently. Um, at the same time, you know, I'm sure that when you had something wrong with you and there was a guy selling a form of drug that was going to treat it, you'd use that too. So um, I would think that the fumigation was the least common of them, but I'm sure that there was very frequent recourse to both drugs and the healing sanctuaries. And then of course, you've got surgery and all that sort of thing that are part of um, healing too. Great. Thank you. I uh, see Cassia, is it, um, has a question or has raised a hand? Yes, I can, if I can ask a question. Please. So. I am really interested, uh, is this uh, little uh, fumigation vessel actually published somewhere with drawings? I recreate ancient fumigation blends from including the Hi Hippocrates uh, corpus. And I would really like to try how it works with the blends, if it actually works. Oh, well, you know, um, this has been published and you can look at the you can see the pictures and you can replicate it if you, you know, if you have, if you are a potter or if you have a potter who can um, replicate it for you. Um, yeah, that would be fascinating to, um, you know, to, uh, to actually try it out. Um, you know, there, there may have been, um, it's always bothered me. That it, it seems like there ought to be a way of covering it. So you could just have an even smaller hole, but uh, you know, if you actually replicate it and tried to work with it, um, you might, you know, it's another way of discovering things about it, sort of experimental archaeology. So go for it. Yeah, I have I have a potter who actually can make it. I just need all the details. Mm. Okay, so if you email me, I can send you the publication, which has the measurements and so forth. Okay, and I will do it. <laughs> I appreciate I would, this. I would love to see you do that. Well, <laughs> that's you. great. That's great. 
Um, so I'm seeing a question from Dara wegman Kitty. Do you want to say that aloud or? Sure, absolutely. And thanks so much, Dr. Rotroff, for your talk. It's just, just fascinating to me. You can ask my students. I teach microbiology. I love always talking about the roots of words. And so when I heard you talk about the lichion, I thought, gosh, it sounds like liquor maybe or elixir. And is there any evidence that those words might have that same root, even like pot liquor when you're talking about cooking, yeah. just means fluids. And then of course, buckthorn um, solutions and buckthorn teas can even be used as a purgative today. So I thought maybe that's a kind of, a, anyway, I'm extrapolating wildly, but maybe there's some evidence. Um, I don't think there's any connection to elixir or liquor. Um, the source of the name is this, the place Lycaon, where a lot Lycia in um, southwestern Turkey, where the plant grew. Although the plant grew everywhere, but you would probably be. I began trying to. I'm sort of interested in botany. I mean, I really don't know much about about plants, but it's it's a minor interest of mine. Um, and I began to track down. Uh, how they identified this lichion with a modern plant. And there, one thing that Dioscorides tells us is that the lichion you get here in Greece and Asia Minor is not the best. The best is made in India hmm. and it's made from a different kind of plant. And he describes that. And there was a British doctor who was... Um, I think he was in charge of a botanical garden in um, the late 19th century. And he was interested in botany and interested in medicine. And he tracked down the Indian plant and the Indian practitioners were still using um, pharmacological literature that was directly descended from the Ascorides and had some of the same names. So they said, this is you know, it was Likum. And of course they were written in Hindi, but he knew Hindi and he knew Arabic. And he has phrases that say, and then I was walking in the Himalayas and I asked, you know, so-and-so, or I was at the bazaar and by, so he was able to make a direct link between the ancient tradition and this medicine, which doctors in the 19th century and the guys who sold unguents in the bazaars were still using. So there's some fascinating um, connections there. And his publication, which is a 19th century article, is still fascinating reading and still valid. Wow. Um, a Ambrose, I see that you have a question. Yeah, my question was just kind of what was the life expectancy of an individual at this time? I'm just trying to like encompass, like, I know we talked about how there were these doctors and these people that were trained professionals as the healthcare professional at the time, kind of like how long they were living. And if so, like what did their kind of like training look like? Um, their training would have been through a kind of apprenticeship and the usual tradition in ancient professions is you did what your father did. So it would be likely that many of these people would have learned in that way. As for life expectancy, um, I'm not a demographer, so um, I, I really can't give you a, a good figure, but short, you know, I would think 40s maybe. Um, but then, you know, if you also have to factor in that an enormous number of people died before they were a year old, infant mortality was tremendous. Um, and then some people lived to be very, very old. Uh, you know, they just had good genes and were lucky. Didn't get, didn't get the plague, you know, didn't get killed in war. Um, but there are people who have tried to figure out, what the life expectancy was, but I'm not one of them and I don't have a good figure, but much shorter than ours. Thank you. Um, I see a question that uh, the questioner is asking me to read it. So um, let me see. Um, Valerie says, thank you for such an enlightening lecture. You showed how involved and longstanding the commitment is to discovering the purpose of even these humble objects. Were chemical analyses conducted of the interiors of the vessels to discern any other substances that may have been made by these druggists? 
that would be a great thing to do. The problem is that all of these objects were found a long time ago. Um, all of the things I showed you from the Agra were found in the 1950s. And at that date, it was typical to wash pottery using a solution of hydrochloric acid. It's great. It gets all the dirt off, all the encrustation. You get these beautiful, shiny looking pots, but um, it makes subsequent um, analysis of the sort that we would like to do nowadays um, pretty much impossible. I mean, it, it, it alters uh, or removes any um, traces of earlier contents that might have been there. And for this pot, that would have been fascinating because mm. uh, you know, an ordinary cooking pot, usually you'll get results like, oh, there's lamb fat, there was, you know, spinach, you know, the kind of things you expect people to cook. Um, and this would be great, but unfortunately, um, it's not possible. I have to find another one and, and treat it right. Does anyone else have a question for Dr. Rotroff? I see uh, Dara um, wrote that we use HCL baths to acid wash labware today, which is definitely <laughs> yeah. true. Uh, Kirsten? Oh. Sorry, I had to figure out oh. where to unmute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering if you can comment on the, the dreams. You know, you hear so much about the dreams, uh, these dream cures and that so many of them were successful. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I'm just wondering if you can comment on, you know, why there are so many records of successful dream cures. Like it doesn't seem like sleeping would cure you <laughs> of well, ability and things like that. And is this in conjunction with some of these other things that are going on that aren't necessarily yeah. mentioned in literary sources right. and things? I think you um, you go to the healing shrine and there are a bunch of people there who are familiar with the common ailments um, and they have they have the means of treating those that are sometimes successful. I mean, some some ailments are um, are susceptible to psychic suggestion too. I mean, we're reading time and time again that you know the mental attitude has a big impact on healing. So if you go to the healing shrine and you have a positive attitude to believe you are going to be healed, um, you've got a better chance than somebody says, this is just garbage and I'm not gonna get healed and I'm not gonna give my gift at the end. You know, that's what happens to you. So I think there was a psychological element to it. I think there was an element of treatment. Um, there are a lot of things that, you know, although these ancient medicines were not, um, you know, tested and tried the way ours are, uh, people did observe that, um, you know, they improved situations. There was also surgery. They could actually do cataract surgery in antiquity. And it was actually somewhat successful and apparently not all that painful. I don't know how they, a lot of opium, I think, uh, on the eyeball, but uh, there were things that they could do to, uh, that were effective. And the people, uh, you know, who knew how to do that, uh, many of them were employed essentially as priests within the healing sanctuaries. So it was a combination of a psychological treatment um, along with a physical treatment. And, um, you know, I've experienced illness in which I have done both. You know, you do some yoga to give yourself relaxation and help your body heal. So um, I think that that's the sort of thing. There's a whole um, study also of dreams. There are people who've devoted a lot of, um, of work to what the dreams people had and so forth. I haven't delved into that literature, but I know it's out there. Well, then in the uh, sanctuary at, at Epidaurus, for instance, there's also the theater and, you know, other like spa-like um, you know, facilities and things like that. Yeah, well, there are usually baths, for instance, and kinds of bathing and drinking the waters. You know, certainly the Victorians swore by drinking the waters. And um, there are springs that were regarded as healthful and may, in fact, have been healthful. Yeah, there's just, it seems like it's always attributed, not always, but so often attributed to the dreams. 
in mm -hmm. literary accounts. Um, and perhaps that's, I mean, of course, it's more holistic than that, but I just think it's interesting. Yeah, but saying I went in and took a pill, that's not a very <laughs> good story. You know, yeah, it's a lot better story when you've got the dream. Yeah. Thank you. I have uh, a question for Dr. Ratoff, if that's okay. Sure, go ahead. Um, uh, Dr. Ratoff, let me just say that I was very impressed with your lecture. I was convinced by all of your arguments. And oh, good. <laughs> That doesn't happen very often. <laughs> but um, I, one angle I wanted to ask you about, which uh, you know I find hard to believe that you wouldn't have considered, is the sophistic element, um, because clearly the sophist, or, or you know what Plato calls the sophist, were very much into medicine. Um, and I'm thinking of Eryximachus, for example, um, from the Symposium in Republic. Mm -hmm. Or actually, from the symposium, <laughs> uh, he doesn't play a part in the Republic. But um, yeah, just wanting to know your thoughts, if you don't mind. Oh gosh, that's something I haven't thought about, and, and I, I should have thought about Eric Simicus because he's a he's a good example of of the medical man and and that conversation of the symposium. And um, I haven't thought about it, um, but I you know the um, you know it's medicine as it develops in the second half of the fifth century, starting out with Hippocrates is in a sense, a part of the sophistic movement in the sense that it's, um, you know, focused on um, sort of uh, rationalism and, you know, coming up with explanations that are logical. Um, so of course it fits in with that, uh, whole thing, but yeah, that would be um, well. It would be a whole other lecture. I have a terrible sure. time fitting this one into an hour. I kept cutting more things off, but it never would. Well, get you did an amazing job, and I would I would just recommend additionally Aristophanes' Clouds, um, where there's a lot of talk about um, quackery and that yeah. sort of thing. Um, well, there are lots of interesting discussions about doctors. One is that doctors are too greedy. They want too much money. Um, and you know, one variant story of Asclepius is that he agreed to raise somebody from the dead because they gave him a lot of money. But <laughs> Zeus um, zapped him with a thunderbolt for that and then had to bring him back to life. But uh, there was that whole sort of light motif. There are quacks, uh, they're greedy, they're rich. Um, but at the same time, many doctors were slaves because it's not in some ways such an appealing profession. You get involved with a lot of disagreeable activities, fumigation and worse. So it was, you know, we had a major, um, Brittany Price, who <laughs> you know, I, I'm just stunned by it because it's like, how do you like being an emergency ward? physician <laughs> it's like there can't be anything pleasant about that um but each to his own to now, Sashans, to fortunately some... there are people who want to do it because we'd sure be in trouble if there weren't <laughs> and, um, yep my sister uh, my one of my sisters is the dean of the school of nursing at the university of texas <laughs> Yeah, but I think in her case, you know, she could have been anything. She could have been a doctor or anything. But at her age, that was about the only thing a woman could do. No, thank you. Um, does anyone else have a question? We might may have time for one, one more. Or maybe we don't have one. In which case, there are definitely also some messages of thanks. Um, thank you for an amazing presentation, just to quote one of them. Um, and I think um, everybody's probably gonna, about to chime in with that thank you, but thank you very much from me and from uh, the Classics Department at Augustana. Um, and I think uh, Kirsten and um, all those who are connected to Augustana would definitely chime into that. Well, oh, I see this long list. That's very, very kind. Thank you very much. Uh May we uh, have, Danielle, would you like to say a word about tomorrow night's lecture? 
Well, I was just, uh, yes, I'm happy to. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Danielle Steen Fatkin. I'm the host for tomorrow night's lecture, also by uh, Professor Rotroff. Um, she'll be talking about ritual objects, different, um, so not, uh, I guess this was also about ritual objects in a way, but different sorts of ritual objects, um, also from the Agora excavations. Um, same bat time, 7.30, although it will be on Zoom. If you go to our society's uh, webpage, westerninillinoisaia.org, you can find the registration information there um, and it will automatically send you a, a link, the Zoom link for tomorrow night's lecture. So um, I hope many of you can come and join us for what's sure to be an exciting addendum uh, to tonight's lecture. Okay, well, thank you all very much for listening to me um, and I very much enjoyed speaking to you and hope to see some of you tomorrow. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, so bye. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. <laughs>